wrong beginning anything with first remembering what Jesus has already done for you. And may we not go about and be concerned about what we have to do. Would we always first be concerned what Jesus has already done for us? Maybe you are, you're, you're new to witnessing. You've never told anybody how to be saved. Can I encourage you and just a brief, just quick second here. Would you go and take a church track this week? Uh, they're, out, they're out there. Now, the church address is on there, the website. And just get these two little words down. You don't have to know vast amount of Scripture in order to lead somebody to Christ. Just a couple little words. Really the understanding, the truth of God's Word. The difference between do and done. Do you know most people believe they're going to heaven? Most people believe they're going to paradise? Most people believe that they're going to nirvana or whatever place, whatever religion that they claim to be. Most people believe in do. D-O. So if you're Islam, the five pillars of Islam. If you're a Buddhist and... Praise the Lord, we led a Buddhist teenager to Christ in Paso Robles of all places. This little young boy, 16 years old, uh, ex-Buddhist now, and an ex-Mormon the same day. Praise the Lord, led a Mormon lady to Christ. But this is two little words, do and done. Every, every religion, every, and that's what religion is. It's an act. It's two things. It's the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you, and then do what you know is right to do. That's religion. Religion doesn't save you. Most people believe in doing. If you can just get that concept and be able to show them uh, that they're lost, that it's not about what you do, it's what Jesus has already done. They're real cl- uh, many people believe in Jesus, but they believe that they must do. Someone needs to tell them, you don't have to do anything. And you can't do anything. Jesus has already done it for you. Are you saved this morning? If you're saved and not ashamed, put your hand way high in, in the air. You know for sure heaven's your home. Praise the Lord. You know, maybe some were not able to raise their hand. I wouldn't leave today without making sure of that salvation. The greatest decision you could ever make is to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. The very answers that you're seeking for but you have not found, they are all in Jesus Christ. Would you take your Bibles with me this morning and, and get them ready? And I've got all kinds of stuff up here. And Mark chapter 9. There it is. Mark chapter 9. I'm going to be done at the top of the hour. And that's, that's not a... I'm trying to rush, but I believe what the Lord has to say, I can say it in about 13 minutes. I know I can. Mark chapter 9. It's a very famous passage in Scripture. Really, it's, I, I believe, one of the saddest passages in Scripture. When Jesus always entered... Uh, situation. He always uh, was the one that had the answers. He could always remedy it. Mark chapter 9, and maybe would you just stand and stretch your legs with me if you're able and willing. Could we read verses 14 through 18? Verse 14, Mark chapter 9. Ready? Begin please. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld Him, were greatly amazed. And running to Him, saluted Him. And He asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should not cast them out. Get it here. Ready? Read it. And they could not. Do you realize that prior to this, Jesus had already given them power to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and here they could not. But yet, He had already given it to them. He had already told them to... Prepare the way. Tell people about me. Uh, Prepare a town and I'll come into that town behind you. Uh, Heal the sick in that town. Cast out the dumb spirits, the the demons. But here they could not. We'll see that today. Father, would you speak to us in this brief time? It's my prayer. Help us. May we leave here with something. 
We came here for something. And I can't give it to them. And no one here can give it to them. No one can give it to me but you, God. Would you give us what we need this morning? Help us, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Thank you for standing and reading, honoring God's Word together. I want to see some effects here of recurring struggles. Who's ever had struggles in life? Job said, man that is born of woman is full of days, is a, a few of days and full of troubles. So I don't like troubles. Well, welcome to the club. Everyone's got troubles. And usually the people with the greatest troubles in life, you don't hear them talking about it. Usually the people with the lesser troubles, really things that aren't really big deal, they talk, not everybody, we all have struggles. We all have things that we can't get over. Here's a man who had a great problem in his home. His son, demon possessed. Struggles mean different things to us. And I see in this passage, this father had it rough. Notice the frustration at the end of verse 18. He said, Spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out. Get rid of this demon. But they could not. How frustrating was that? He heard of other people, uh, uh, the demons being cast out of them. Uh, he came to Jesus because he heard that Jesus had done it for somebody else. That Jesus had done it for somebody else's child. But he comes and Jesus wasn't there, so he goes to the next best thing, the disciples. There were nine of them at the bottom of the mountain. At this time, Jesus was on the top with Peter, James, and John, the Mount of Transfiguration. Interesting, at the bottom of the mountain, the nine disciples, you know who was in this group? Thomas. We say about what of Thomas? He was a doubting Thomas. You know who else was in the nine down there? Philip. Someone said to Philip, hey, we found the Messiah. And immediately Philip said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Doubter. Lack of faith. And this man comes expecting the man of God to help his son. And they, what, could not. Frustrating. I don't know how far this man traveled, but he came, and he came to the foot of the mountain, and he worked his way in, and he, he came and he found that someone he thought that could help, but they could not. Have you ever, or maybe are you in a struggle, or in the past, you've struggled with something, and you thought someone could help you, and you went to help, and you never got it. Frustrating. You leave just the same as you came. Also see a fatigue. This, this father, in verse 21, Jesus asked him, he said, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. He said, We've been dealing with this for a long time. Look at verse 22. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire. Who do you think went after the son to get him out of the fire? Dad probably had some burns on him, rescuing his demon-possessed son from jumping in fire and into water as the demon would throw the son. Uh, demon-possessed, go into the water. Who had to go in and rescue that son from drowning? Dad. Who's ever done caretaker work and you take care of someone who's a senior or, or a special needs child Talk about this case 24-7. How much sleep did this father lose over the course of these years of taking care of his son because he couldn't leave him alone. He didn't know what this boy would do or where he would go. Protect him from the fire. Protect him from drowning. Uh, keep sharp objects away from him. You see a fatigue here. Look at verse 22. It says, uh, He does to destroy him, but if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Because I'm tired. Struggles are frustrating, especially when you don't get help for them. Reoccurring struggles. Struggles bring fatigue. Wears you out. Look at verse 23. 
Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe! Help thou mine unbelief. What is unbelief? It's doubt. It's the absence of faith. You know what that is? It's fear. Fear and faith don't necessarily coincide together. Look at his father's fear. He didn't know what was going to happen. He was fearful. Struggles bring fear in a heart. Is there some fear in your heart for a struggle you have? Jesus always has the answers. Aren't you glad for that? The disciples tried to alleviate this situation. But in verse 18, they could not. They were powerless. They were missing something. Jesus had told them to do it, but somehow they couldn't do it. They were powerless. Verse 14, as we read, there was a great multitude, not just a multitude, but a great multitude. You see the embarrassment of the disciples. Nine of them. In front of everybody. They couldn't do it. How embarrassing. These were known men to follow Jesus. But they could not. Powerless. They're embarrassed. Verse 28. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why? Why could we not cast him out? They were confused. I thought, but why? There are things in life that we are powerless to do. In fact, let's be honest this morning. There are a lot of things in this life that we are powerless to do. And then let's get biblical this morning. Jesus said in John 15, Without me, ye can do nothing. The biblical truth is, you can do zero, zero, nada, nothing, without Jesus Christ. Somehow these... Disciples missed it. They couldn't do it. Because Jesus had something. Jesus wasn't part of the equation. And until Jesus becomes part of the equation, you're going to continue to keep struggling and struggling and struggling. It's going to be a reoccurring struggle. Something has to happen. You ever feel as a Christian, you're just treading water? You work hard. You come to church, you go soul winning, come on folks, 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 you read your Bible every day, you pray every day, you're faithful to your spouse, you, stick, you, you, you don't uh, go to things immoral on the computer or the television or in this world, you, you try to keep yourself pure, but somehow I'm just not going anywhere. And a Sunday school class is not growing, or a church is floundering, or, or a marriage is the fire that was there is not there anymore, or a spouse, or somebody that you love dearly is not saved, and you're praying for them, and they seem to be getting worse than making steps towards getting saved. And there's something, it's beyond you, it's bigger than you. It's a reoccurring struggle. Everyone has them. Just something. Everyone's got one. Just It's a reoccurring struggle. Can't get over it. What is it? Why? How, as the disciple said in verse, verse 28, why could we not? You ever ask yourself that question? Why is it not changing? Why is this not getting better? Why is this not growing? Why are my children... Why? Why? Jesus gave the answer. And it's almost so simple, we fall trapped to the same thing that the father 
of the child, a lot of the people there in the great multitude, and the disciples also fell trapped too. They didn't believe in what Jesus said. Can you look at the verse, please? Here's Jesus' answer. Verse 29. And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Fasting is a very unique and very amazing thing. Fasting suppresses the flesh. And it gives way for the spirit that, as you've been saved, for the spirit to rise and God to have his way in your life. Probably in a crowd this size, knowing statistics and studying statistics, there is more than one man in here that looks at pornography. I don't want to say who it is. I don't know if there's, maybe there's not anybody. But statistically, that's what the society is we live in today. And as I understand, the group that's on the greatest rise in pornography is women. We have some in our church, ladies, that are struggling with pornography. And I send them to Emily and you talk to her. People that struggle with addictions. We, I said in Sunday school, our church is raw. People come to Christ and they come with all sorts of baggage, don't they? And when you came to Christ and when I came to Christ,